Maui police Continue. blockaded escape so routes. So I around back to Front Street, and there were all the cars were lined up, but none of them were moving. And I walked all the way from Safeway to the chart house, not one car had moved. And I was wondering what was stopping the traffic. Well, it was a policeman. And I got to the end, and I looked up north. There were no obstructions. There was no reason to keep those cars there. Are you serious? I'm serious as a heart attack. And I, I said, what are you doing? He goes, well, I'm under orders to keep them here. And I said, the fire is, is right around Safeway. It's going to hit Front Street. You know, these people got to get out of here. And he said, I'm following orders. No way. And I, so I just kept walking. And I, well, maybe you know something I don't, you know. So, And I keep walking down the highway, and I look behind. No cars are coming out. I walked all the way to Waikuli Beach, still no cars coming out, and I started hearing boom, 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 and then I heard people screaming and stuff. You're saying they were blockaded in by the police at the end of Front Street? Yeah. Like where that restaurant is? Right, where the chart house was. Where the chart house was, I should right. say. They, there was a blockade there, and they could not go any further. Right. I walked, what the I hell? Said, I walked all the way from Safeway to there, not one car had moved, and people walking in front of me, the people in the cars are saying, would you like a ride? And they're going, oh, okay, and they'd get in. They asked me how to no you better get out of here you know it, and uh but they just well we were told to evacuate by car I was, okay so i just kept walking and i got all the way to uh like i said the civic center and then i started hearing all the explosions and there was no one walking behind me or on bicycles or anything well, hello everyone welcome to empathic times my name is amira and we are going to be looking at the travesty that has occurred in lahaina hawaii over the last several days after a devastating apocalyptic like fire has completely devastated this region and people the official story that we are being told is that these fires were started primarily from downed power lines and faults on the utility grid so far the official death count is at 106 people at the time of this recording which is august 16th on wednesday we are being told that officially a combination of downed power lines and hurricane-like winds are what blew this fire to its devastating proportion for which it completely destroyed Lahaina, a historic area of Hawaii. This is a region that has both a combination of very wealthy, affluent individuals, many of them celebrities, and then everyone else. The locals, the working class, and they are, of course, the ones that we are seeing in all of the devastation and destruction that have been hit the absolute worst. So the official story is that this was from a combination of downed power lines, short circuits or partial circuits, and high excessive winds due to a hurricane system that was about 200 miles from Hawaii. However, the locals tell a slightly different story. And that's what we're going to get into today. So let's take a look and see what the locals saw, what they experienced, and how this devastating event just seems to have a few too many convenient coincidences. We were fighting. We felt like we were winning. We were keeping it at bay, keeping it off of the properties. The water shut off. Even the firemen that were patrolling couldn't refill their trucks. The fire just grew and the sparks started blowing over and, and it just beat us in the end. I don't know, you're standing there with a hose and there's nothing coming out and you see the fire coming over and you see parts of your house starting to take, starting to burn and you just feel you're kind of defeated at the moment. You're going, why? You know, we did everything and all we could think of was we have no water, we can't do anything. Jump in our cars and skedaddle, get out of town. And they come back in the morning and see the place all burnt down. I was concerned about his safety and then yeah. as soon as I saw him in the car, like he saw him, that means that's not good. And he just said, we lost the house. I was going to retire. I mean, I am retired, right? But now I got a new life. So I need a new, new journey. I've been in my road. Makes you want to cry, you know? Still love it. Still love it. And that's why they say, would you move to Honolulu? I mean, I could move to Honolulu, but it's the people and the climate. Like, it's like, it's, it's beautiful up here. And uh, it'd be hard to leave. I 
go drive down the bypass for a minute and just see how far we go and just see what happens and then Great. we can just come back up and turn around because it's just an open highway at this point. So as we can see from just these couple of accounts, this is absolutely devastating and heartbreaking for these people. The first resident talking about the firemen losing access to the water supply because it was turned off, as well as locals losing their access to water from just their hoses, and also there were some reports of fire hydrants not working. This is a serious issue when you have a wildfire going on, any type of fire, you need to be able to have access to water. Because this was such a quick moving fire that even some firemen have said they've never seen anything like like this. It adds to all of the different coincidences that just start to make people scratch their heads and wonder what is really going on here? How is it possible that this many things failed? How is it possible that this many things broke down? That water is shut off and locals and firemen can't even use their water and fire trucks ran out of water and just were not able to do anything. How is it possible that cell service went down? How is it possible that sirens were not giving people any adequate warning of what was actually happening? And going back to the very first clip shown, how is it that a police officer is blockading the road that is being used for the evacuation and that once people did get some evacuation orders, people were following those orders and then being stopped. And that police officer's response was, I'm just following orders. These are all things that are adding to people's weariness of believing the official accounts because there's just so many different factors that are making people say, what is really going on here? Because there's just, there's a lot of different coincidences that seem to be happening. How is it that all of these things could break down? How is it that so many failures of systems can happen? These were all of the different factors that were going on that day. School was canceled. The water was turned off. The escape route was blocked off. All Hawaii officials were off island when the fire occurred. They didn't sound the alarms. They did not use phone alert systems and then also the other aspect of this is that following in the just couple, barely a couple of days since the fires have even just been put out land offers are being made to the indigenous people donations are being confiscated and collected put in metal containers instead of given to the people all the land that was trying to be purchased was destroyed and maui natives will not be able to afford rebuilding and anyone not compliant and staying at a fema shelter is being denied help these are, these are locals saying that our government betrayed the Native Hawaiians and burned them out of their land and history. So these are a lot of different factors kind of all happening at the same time. The fact that school was canceled and waters turned off, escape routes being blocked off. It really does, from the people's perspective, the people that dealt with this situation, it's their belief, their feeling that this was somewhat intentional or at least the efforts to do the best that they could to save both the people and the property wasn't there, that those efforts were not there. And when you see all of these different accounts from locals, it's kind of hard to deny a little bit of that reality, especially when it's barely days after people are still people on the ground seeing how many more of the missing because there's still 1300 people that are missing how many of those remains are going to be found in what's left of this completely decimated area and the fact that realtors 
and large conglomerates likely like BlackRock and Vanguard are reaching out to do a land grab. It's one of those things you kind of can't help but feel both for the locals that are dealing with the situation and also just the complete lack of empathy, the lack of seeing the kind of moment that people are in. And when you see a vulture class, because that is what the elites, that is what the military industrial complex, that is what the media complex, that is what the BlackRock and Vanguard folks are. They are a vulture class. We saw this during the 2020 pandemic when they were buying up entire suburbs. This is not completely far from the possible reality of what's going on, especially when we see things like this. Hawaiian government officials in the areas that were just affected by the wildfires passed a law saying that that land could not be redistricted for new building permits unless some sort or some type of a serious natural disaster occurred. Serious natural disaster occurred. And what did we have happen through those three districts of very sacred land to the Hawaiians? A very serious natural disaster. I'm not going to get into space lasers and all of that shit, but people called their insurance companies after the fire and the insurance companies for the first time informed them that there was zoning infractions on their land so they would not honor their insurance policies. And within 24 hours of these people losing their homes, the same developers who the Hawaiian elders fought in court to have that law passed are already calling these people and making them offers for their homes. This is what happens when the government sticks their fingers in everything. The government's in the insurance industry. And they're talking to people who are paying for their campaigns, which are the buyers of this land. And they say to these people, hey, let us know when they call you to get their insurance claims and let us know when you deny them so we can then give them a call right away and scoop in and swoop in and be the heroes. So they're going to get this land that they're going to develop into millions of dollars worth of property. And the Hawaiian elders are going to get fuck off. They're going to get screwed over. And this happens everywhere. There's too many coincidences for this not to be shady. Wake up. So he is absolutely right. There are way too many coincidences happening. The fact that these people were paying into their insurance, reached out to their insurance, and now all of a sudden, things like zoning restrictions or zoning issues are coming out, something that these people have not been informed of, and that's restricting them from getting the aid that they have been paying into. Not only is that such a slap across the face that you're paying into something that is supposed to help you in these times of need, and now that you need it, it's not available. But like he said, it's this confluence of all of these different things coming together. They're going to deny their claims, say it's because of zoning, and then let people like realtors and developers know that, oh, we're denying them their claim so that now these big conglomerates can come in. And this is what happens when people lose everything. These people come in that have zero care for the people. They have zero care for the land and the history there. And they're not going to give a flying fuck about these people and their history and the situation that's happening to them and the fact that they're reaching out to them so soon after this devastating event, it does. It really shows how this vulture class is just eating up every little bit that they possibly can while gaslighting and acting like, oh, it's all because of the climate. Oh, it's all because of this or that. When it's just there are too many things that line up to say this does not seem right. Which lends to another aspect of this, which is that there has been a plan in the works to make Maui a 15-minute city. And the only way that they could do something like this was by, like that guy said, a completely natural devastating event that happens that makes it so that this is the only viable option that people have because they're not going to be able to rebuild their insurance isn't going to help them rebuild. And also the cost of supplies, as we all know, because of inflation being absolutely insane under the Biden economics plan, these people are not going to be able to rebuild most likely. That is going to allow conglomerates to do things like this, setting up a Maui new smart grid, the Jumpstart Maui 
project. This is what people are suspecting this land grab was all about. They are wanting to turn Maui into a 15 minute city where everything is all electric. And it just so happens that the bulk of where this would be taking place is in Lahaina. It's one of those things, the more that one looks into this, the fishier things get. As well as when we look at, as heck I said, he's like, I'm not going to go into lasers or directed energy weapons, but we're going to actually take a look at that because it is worth looking into. So one of the things that has come out is the director of the Directed Energy Directorate Air Force Research Laboratory. Dr. Kelly D. Hammett, he is a member of the Senior Executive Service, is a director of the Directed Energy Directorate at the Air Force Research Laboratory, Kirtland Air Force Base. His 20-year active duty career spanned a variety of positions, mainly focused on directed energy weapon system technology development and acquisition, and culminated while serving as the Director of Engineering for the $7 billion Airborne Laser Program. He served as the chief engineer of the directed energy directorate's optics division he was the division's authority for system engineering practices provided technical oversight across a 100 million dollar per year portfolio of optical sites slash systems and oversaw comprehensive modernization and upgrade programs for the starfire optical range and the maui space surveillance system and then leading from that we see the afrl air force office of scientific research talking about directed energy research opportunities. And one of those happens to be in Maui, Hawaii, as well as the Kirtland Air Force Base. And this is the Directed Energy Directorate of the Air Force Research Laboratory is the United States Air Force's Center of Excellence for Directed Energy Technology with an annual operating budget exceeding 300 million. The workforce of 800 plus people develop and transition research technologies into military systems. And this leads to another aspect of what locals were recording where someone said, my initial suspicion three days ago was arson to be followed by a 15-minute city, the first in the country. Seems I was right. And here's some Maui fire footage that I'm not supposed to share because it begs that question of what the hell is going on here? We see a lightning strike, but then there's a complete column of bright light that one can see when we're looking at this. That is not normal. So it begs that question when we see... There's just so many situations where it just, it begs that question, hmm, what is happening here? And when you see something like this, a column of light coming from the sky right next to lightning, it just makes you go, hmm. Something that just is making a lot of people scratch their heads and ask the question, how on earth is that possible? How did that move so quickly? There is now a book that was published on August 10th, the story of the 2023 Maui fire and its implications for climate change. Fire and Fury, the story of the Maui fire and its implications for climate change is a gripping and eye-opening account of one of the most devastating wildfires in Hawaii's history and how it reveals the urgent need to address the global climate crisis. The book chronicles the events of August 8th through 11th, Mind you, this thing was posted on August 10th, 2023, when a massive fire swept across the island of Maui, fueled by drought, heat, and hurricane winds. The book describes the harrowing experiences of the people who lived through the fire, as well as the heroic efforts of the firefighters and resources who battled the flames. The book also examines the causes and consequences of the fire, which 
is surprising because we're still trying to figure out all of that information, both locally and globally, and how it exposes the vulnerability of our society and our planet to the impacts of climate change. The book draws on scientific research, eyewitness accounts, official reports, and media coverage to provide a comprehensive and compelling narrative of the Maui fire and its implications for climate change. Now, it's really interesting that they're saying official reports and eyewitness accounts. Now, the eyewitness accounts is really the most telling one because there are so many eyewitnesses to this fire that have just started in the last day or two have just started to actually gain access to wi-fi to the internet and get their phones to work and we're actually starting to see a little bit more evidence coming out so a lot of people have seen this and are asking the question how is it possible that a book that's about 44 pages was published on august 10th of 2023 when it says in the description that it's chronicling the events of August 8th through the 11th. How can you publish a book a day before the window of time for which you're claiming your book is about? Thank goodness this book only has one star. But it's one of those things where it's like, one, why are you publishing a book about something that is still ongoing? The research and the investigation is still being done. We still don't know how many people are gone. We have over 1,300 people still missing and unaccounted for. It's that question of how did you get this out? And it's the optics of it as well, right? Like, am I crazy? Like, does this not seem like something that you should not be doing? You are trying to profit off of people's pain and suffering that has not even subsided for a moment. And you have the gall, the audacity to publish something like this and make money from it because people are likely going to buy this because it's by Dr. Miles Stone, which seems like an authority figure, even though it's bullshit. Like it's stuff like this is what's making people just scratch their heads and feed into those alternative theories because this just seems really convenient that all of a sudden there's a book published acting like it's an authority on this with eyewitness accounts when we're still to this day getting eyewitness accounts from these people like we we're still getting more information and and there's even articles talking about it's almost like they had a written script dr miles stone's fire and fury maui book on amazon leaves the internet baffled yeah it does leave the people baffled because it's like what the hell is going on in the wake of the Maui fires that started last week on August 8th, several conspiracy theories have emerged on the internet about the causes behind it. Initially, government agencies and several media outlets such as the BBC and The Guardian reported that the blazes were caused by dry, drought-like conditions worsened by strong winds brought forth by Category 4 Hurricane Dora. However, as the week passed by, the social media users conducted their own investigation and spun many alternative theories behind the frames. One group believes that the Maui fires were the result of an energy weapon or a laser beam launched by government agencies that caused an explosion on the island. Others speculate that Maui was artificially set on fire by the elites and real estate companies and investors to grab lands from the natives who otherwise refused to sell them and turn the island into a smart city or sell them to celebrities for millions of dollars. Amid such conspiracy theories, the latest one circulating on the internet is a book titled Fire and Fury, the story of the 2023 Maui fire and its implications for climate change written by a certain Dr. Miles Stones. The book was published on August 10th on Amazon only two days after the Maui fires began, and we're still raging, by the way, and its topic has left the internet baffled. The nonfiction talks about the Maui fires at large, their causes, impacts, and relation to climate change. People found it rather unsettling that the book got printed and even became available on Amazon while the fires were still ongoing. They are now speculating that the author may have known about the fires long before it happened and was thus able to publish a book so fast on this topic. In this regard, several ex-users have commented under at Rising Stone's tweet, on the same. So yeah, it is. It's weird that someone's writing a book about this and profiting off of people's pain when they haven't even gotten a semblance of closure. There are so many people still missing. There are so many people hurting from this and will continue to hurt from this. And this just, it's, it's just more evidence of the lack of empathy that we have in so many areas. And I think one of the worst bits of this 
as I talk about in so many of these videos, is the fact that the people of Maui, the residents that have suffered from this catastrophic event, are going to get a one-time payment of $700 from the Biden administration. Whereas the people of Ukraine are getting endless monetary support for an endless war that's just filling the coffers of the military industrial complex, our political elite, and the vulture class. These are things I talk about all the time here. The people are not getting the support that they need. Our country is suffering. The people of our country are suffering. And we continue to see these devastating events in Lahaina, Hawaii, in East Palestine, Ohio, and countless other regions. We have unclean water. We have unclean food. We have unclean air. And we are continued to be fed so much gaslighting rhetoric about this being our fault because of climate, this being our fault because of stimulus checks, this being our fault because of this or that. When no, the fault is on our system. The fault is on our politicians that are being paid off and completely corrupted by Big Corp, Big Pharma, the military industrial complex, and the Hollywood elites that are all cozy with each other and they're all covering for each other. So in ending this video, I want to say that my heart goes out to every single person that has been affected by this devastating event. It shouldn't have happened. They should be getting as much support as they can possibly get. If we have billions of dollars that we can spend to go to war, then by golly, we should be able to help the people of our own country when a devastating event like this happens. People should not be having to worry about still going to their jobs so that they can pay their bills. People should not be having to worry if they're going to be able to keep food in their bellies and a roof over their head and, and have care for their family and their children and their friends. They should not have to worry about these things and the fact that people are having to start GoFundMes, the fact that people are having to reach out to charities in the United States, what is considered to be a first world country, is heartbreaking and devastating. So my heart goes out to every single person that has suffered from this. I have links in the description box below of the organization within Hawaii that is able to directly provide aid to people on the ground, please do not donate to the Red Cross. As a lot of people are saying online, it is just not the area that you should, it's not the place that you should be giving your money. And the other thing too that people are asking is that if you are planning on a taking a trip to the region, to please take that money that you would have been spending on that vacation and donate some of that to the people of Hawaii. These people are going to be in need for a very, very long time. And if you can provide any type of monetary support, please do so. Please check out the links in the description box. And my heart just goes out to everyone affected by this. This should not be happening. People should not be having to deal with this on their own. Their government should be helping them. Our president should be able to speak to this and not just say no comment and spending his time on a beach. To every single person suffering from this, my heart goes out to you. I send you love and light and I hope that healing can happen. And I know that people will get through this. So thank you so much for watching. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you would like to subscribe to this channel, hit that subscribe button, share with anyone that you think might find this information helpful. And as always, stay safe, take care, and be kind to each other.